This is the second half of Lesson 1 in Change of Tandem. We're going to look at rates of change in functions today. We say the graph of a function is concave up on intervals where the rate of change is increasing. So if we look at this picture down below, you can see that the slope or the rate of change is increasing by thinking about little tiny lines of the slope along the curve. And you can tell the slope goes from negative here. This is negative. At some point, it's a zero slope, and then it's a positive slope, and the slopes are getting larger in a positive direction. So that indicates our graph is concave up. The graph would be concave down on intervals where the slope or the rate of change is decreasing. And we can do the same thing in this second example. I have a positive slope here, and then at some place it's zero slope, and then negative and negative and negative in a more negative fashion. So you can think of slope as the rate of change and vice versa in this case. Also, in example five, we can see that the graph of G shown in our image here, we want to use that graph to find intervals where G has the following behavior. So we're looking for where G is increasing. And if you think about increasing, that would start here at negative three and continue to increase over to two. And then here's a decrease, and then we're increasing from four to infinity. So from negative three to two, we're increasing, and from four to infinity. Remember, we don't bracket infinity. Where is G decreasing? That would be from negative infinity to negative three, and again, from two to four. These are X values. In our course, it's going to be important to use language correctly. So I've made two notes to you here. When we say increasing and concave up, that means that our function is increasing at an increasing rate. And when we say increasing and concave down, that means that our function is increasing at a decreasing rate. You might want to pause the video and give that some thought by drawing small slope lines along the curve. Can you answer where the function g is concave up in our image here? If we look, we can see that concave up, we are concave up here, increasing at an increasing rate. So I've got severe negative slopes. The slope goes to zero and then some positive slopes. But when our function gets to this point, negative a half, the positive slopes start to decrease and the function becomes concave down in this area. So we're concave up from negative infinity to negative one half. The function is concave down over to three and then concave up again from three to infinity. You might want to think about the slopes or the rates of change as you consider concave up and concave down. Then where is G both increasing and concave up? So we're increasing and concave up between negative three 
and negative one half, and we're increasing and concave up between four and infinity. Let's go back and look at the graph here. I'm increasing and concave up from negative three to negative half. So it's just this portion of the concave up. And we're increasing and in concave up from four to infinity. Where is G concave down? We're concave down from negative a half over to positive three. Later on, we're gonna learn that these two particular points where concavity changes, those are gonna be named points of inflection, but that's not until lesson four. Then in part F, where is G both decreasing and concave down? So the function is decreasing and concave down. Right in this, this section is concave down. So it's decreasing and concave down between two and three. In these next two examples, we're just reviewing some information from Algebra 2. First, we want to consider what is an x-intercept and a y-intercept. And you can see in our function graph in example 6, we have an intercept at negative 3, we have an intercept at 1, and we have an intercept at 4. Those are x-intercepts where the y value is 0, the x value is a number, and the y value is zero. Where a y-intercept is where x is zero, and our y value is a number. So that would be down here at negative three. Zero, negative three. So we wanna be able to list x-intercepts correctly and y-intercepts correctly. We have x-intercepts, at negative three, zero, one, zero, and four, zero. So we'll list those in set notation. And we have a y-intercept, just one y-intercept, at the ordered pair, zero, negative three. Example seven, we're looking at intercepts, but we're gonna do this algebraically. So you can see the rule of four playing in here. Here's a graphic method of the rule of four graphically, and here's algebraically using factoring skills. In the first, let's think about this. If we want to um, factor by grouping in the first two, we could factor out an x squared, leaving x minus three. And in the second two terms, if we factor out a negative four, that would also leave us an x minus three setting that equation y equals to zero, you can see that both x minus three is the distributive property, and then the terms that are the coefficients out here are GCF, x squared minus four, so the distributive property twice, once x squared multiplied by x minus 3, and once negative 4 multiplied by x minus 3. And then solving, either factoring one more time as the difference of two squares, and then setting each factor equal to 0 x plus 2 would be 0 when x is negative 2, so this is a x-intercept. x minus 2 is 0 when x is positive 2, an x-intercept. And x minus 3 is 0 when x is positive 3, another x-intercept. So we can list the x-intercepts as negative 2, 2, and 3. These are called solutions to the function where f of x is zero. In example eight, we've got a verbal use of the rule of four. 
I'll work example eight and then you can look at example nine. If Tina is a sales clerk at Electronics Depot and she earns $325 as her base pay plus $18 for each item sold, I want to express her gross salary G as a function of the number X of items sold. We want to find her gross pay if she sells 24 items. So we can write an equation that models that behavior. She first gets $325 as her base pay, and then she's paid $18 for every X number of items she sold. So there's a, an equation that models the verbal expression. We translated from verbal to algebraic, and then we're gonna numerically substitute 24 if she sold 24 items. That's 18 times 24, which is 432 extra dollars. So 325 and 432 tells us that Tina will earn a total of $757 if she sells 24 items. Let's look at example nine. If your pre-calculus book is dropped from a height of 45 feet on planet Newton, its height in feet after t seconds is approximately 45 minus 14 t squared. How long does it take for the book to hit the surface of the planet? So what do you suppose we should do? I wanna know when h of t hits the surface of the planet, so that would be an x-intercept at zero. And h of t is 45 minus 14 t squared. When does that reach zero? Well, if we solve and isolate 14 t squared on the right and 45 on the left, I know I'm saying that backwards, but it works out, then t squared is 45 divided by 14, and we're gonna solve for t by taking the positive square root, since we don't wanna consider negative time, and using a calculator, if you wanna estimate that, is about 1.793, and our units are in seconds, so in about 1.8 seconds, your pre-calculus book hits the ground. In this final example, there's a full page of concepts we've learned in this first lesson. And you need to be careful as you're working through them. If you look at the function f that goes along here, the parabola, the constant term, and then that line. And function g is made up of this line, another line, another line, and another line. So four line segments is function G. I would highly recommend that you turn the video off and try these on your own to see if you truly understand the concepts from the lesson, and then come back and check your work against my work. The domain of the function is all real numbers. The function f is all real numbers. The domain of function g is also all real numbers. The value where f of x is zero, those are our x-intercepts. They happen at negative four, two, and then I had to extend that line to figure out that the third zero would happen at 15. And on the g of x graph, we had x-intercepts or solutions at negative two, five, and seven. In part C, the values where f and g were equal to each other happened at negative three, positive three, and nine. On part D, f of x is greater than g of x, not greater than or equal to, so we don't wanna close up the endpoints on our intervals. 
negative, eight, negative infinity to negative 3, f is above g, and f is greater than g on the interval from 3 to 9. In part e, where f is less than g, should be from negative 3 to 3, and from 9 to infinity. On part f, g is greater than 0 from negative 2 to 5, and also from 7 to infinity. On part g, the values of x where f is less than 0 or below the x-axis would happen at negative 4 to 2, that's the first interval, and then again from 15 to infinity. That's a bad looking 5 there, 15 to infinity. The values of x where f of x increases is from negative 1 to 3 and a half. And again, depending on what your teacher prefers, I prefer increasing to be on closed intervals. If your teacher likes open intervals, we'll stick with that as well. So it just depends on your teacher's preference. College Board won't penalize us for those intervals. On letter I, we want the values where f of x is constant. That's three and a half to 6, and again, I'm using closed intervals. The value of x where g of x decreases is from 3 to 6, and the values of x where f of x is positive is from negative infinity to negative 4, and then again from 2 to 15. And then the last piece, the values of x where f of x decreases, f of x is decreasing from negative infinity to negative 1, and it's also decreasing on 6 to infinity. I hope you did well on that example. See you for lesson 2.